Um, so this is Simon uh, can't be here this evening and also won't be here, won't be able to be here next week. So I'll be hosting the talks. Uh, as you know, this is the series. Uh, we had Mao doing a talk last week. And this evening, we have Anna Conan, who teaches on the curating program here on the MFA. So some of you will be very familiar with Anna. I think those of you, certainly in the first year of the Fine Art MFA, probably won't know Anna so well. So it's a nice moment for Anna to introduce herself to you. Presentation, I think Anna's presentation will be about 50 minutes this week, 40 to 50. Um, and then we'll have the usual format discussion with me asking some questions, trying to wrap up what the presentation, some issues from the presentation, and then we'll throw it open to you guys. Um, so Anna, as I said, teaches on the MFA curating program. Uh, she's an independent curator, educator, researcher based in uh, East Kent, just down the road over here. Uh, or oh, quite a long train journey, actually, I found out today. Um, and Anna's main interests are in social practice, critical pedagogy, alternative institutional models, and critical and participatory landscape. And so it's quite a continuity with the issues of ecological stewardship that Roz was introducing to us uh, in the first set of talks. Uh, institutionally, Anna is co-curating the second edition of the Art and Industry Triennial in Dunkirk, uh, which I think opens next summer. At summer runs for about six months. Anna was the co-founder and director of Open School East, which is an uh, incredibly important initiative founded around 2013, initially in London, then moved to Margate for the obvious reasons that people can't be in London anymore. Um, and it was very important because it sort of challenged the model of professionalization through programs like this one. So to become professional artists, you have to do the MFA and so on and so forth. And Anna and colleagues with Open School Lease set up a counter model, which was less dependent upon the funding structures. It was a response partly to the, the requirement for students to pay their fees, certainly UK-based students and EU students to pay full fees um, uh, to, to do this kind of program. Um, and it also presented a number of challenges to programs like ours in terms of how we're responding to emerging artists' needs. Unfortunately, uh, the fees issue still remains a very difficult one for us to get around. Um, has Open School, Open School East finished 2020? Is it still, still going? Okay, still going. Um, so Anna's also worked as a curator at Lafayette Participation, Anticipation, sorry, <laughs> and was co-curator with Lydia of the British Art Show 8 in 2015-16, uh, director at Beton Salon in Paris, and curator at Gasworks in 2010. And I should also add that Anna's talk is going to be based partly on her PhD, which she recently completed at the University of Nottingham. So Dr. Anna, Anna Connell, welcome. So hi, everyone. Can, can you hear me? Yes. If you can't hear me for one reason or another, please let me know. Um, that's your phone. Case. Um, so thank you, first, um, Surel, for having me tonight, and Simon for inviting me to this series. Um, I'm going to do something I don't usually do, which might be a little bit dry, but I'm going to be reading quite a bit. I thought it was a lecture. <laughs> and, um, and because I'm talking about my PhD research, which is very recent, I, it's quite hard also to, um, it's quite hard to summarize um, six years of research into a 45 minute um, lecture. So I've had to pack a lot of things in and, uh, but I have put some quotes on, um, on the presentation. Um, it might be a little bit disconnected at times. And what I'll do is that um, I'll be talking about a large part of my PhD research and also about the notion of institutional permaculture or permacultural institution, which I am freshly starting to um, think about uh, with the help of a few others. Um, so I'll be reading extracts from my PhD, kind of uh, mixing it with um, other bits of writing. And I will also be talking about 
my case studies, which uh, constitute the core of my PhD. So it might feel, again, you know, a bit disconnected. I'll be talking about organizations that you don't necessarily know so much about, but hopefully, uh, bit by bit, it will start making sense and you'll see where I'm going, I'm hoping. Um, uh, participant enables, hang on, there's something on, yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start, if that's okay. Um, oh yeah, okay, this is here. So I'm all good. Um, so my PhD was titled um, Alternative to What? Alternative How? A study of multi-public educational and cultural spaces in England since the late 19th century. It's dedicated to the study of the foundational decades um, of three organizations that all started in East London. Um, the first one is, if I can get this to work, Toynbee Hall. Um, the second one is Center Prize, and the third one is Open Schoolist, which um, um, Sir Elm just mentioned. And all these three organizations um, have combined the trinal functions of school, community center, and cultural space. They were multivision, multipurpose, and multipublic. And um, they were chosen because they deemed themselves alternative, whether through their pedagogical, cultural, and social engagement or practice, their governance model, and or their conceptualization and use of architectural space. Core to their mission was um, the democratic ideals of togetherness and of equality of access to education and culture, along with the preoccupation to, uh, with developing participants' agency, rebalancing power relations, and making the experience of education non-alienating and emancipatory. This study is dedicated to questioning how these spaces understood and situated themselves as alternatives, and how they enacted their alternativeness. So moving within and beyond these case studies, um, this study this PhD examines the qualities, the values, and the prerequisites of what I have proposed to name public, multi-public educational and cultural organizations. By the same means, it scrutinizes the hurdles associated with the effort to remain alternative with the passing of time and that which comes with it. So processes of habituation, temptation or pressure to scale up, ethos bending fundraising exercises, long tenure, as well as the plain desire for stability and sustainability. The revolutionary agenda of neoliberalism has accomplished a lot in the way of physical and institutional change this last 20 years. Consider the dual impact of deindustrialization and the diminution of trade union powers in Britain and the United States, for example. So why then can we not envision equally dramatic changes, though pointing in a different direction, as we seek for alternatives? So in the 20 years or so that have passed since geographer David Harvey wrote these lines in Spaces of Hope, neoliberalism has led further revolutionary physical and institutional change. Among other significant events that are pertinent to the subject matter of this thesis, England, which is the geographical focus of my PhD, has witnessed number one, or maybe not in this order, but the gentrification of numerous city centers and rural and coastal areas, the commodification of higher education, and last but not least, withdrawal from the European Union. In the face of the extreme increase in the cost of living and education prompted by these events, and of ever widening socioeconomic inequalities, the need for dramatic changes pointing in a different direction is all the more pressing today. In capitalist realism is there no alternative, and later in Ghost of My Life, political and cultural theorist Mark Fisher laments over the fact that the dramatic changes that Harvey was hoping for still haven't materialized beyond short-term acts of resistance without lasting legacy. Fisher asks, could it be that there are no breaks, no shocks of the new to come? How long ago did the last big thing happen and just how big was it? Rather than shocking, surprising, or dramatic, the approaches to social change and the production of alternatives that seem to have gained momentum over the last decade have been subtle and less visible, though no less continuous. 
They have been slow, third, dissented. The slow movements started to gain currency in the last two decades, yet its relevance and appeal have been recognized on a far greater scale since the climate crisis became a daily reality, and in particular, since the global pandemic, which has um, simultaneously heightened injustices and marked a shift in our relationship to time, productivity, fatigue, mortality, well-being, nature, and food. After the much earlier slow food movements started in 1986, the use of terms such as slow school, slow curating, slow fashion, slow institutions, and slow science, to name but a few, is now recurrent in these given fields of practice. Besides opposing accelerationism, slow stands for sustainable, responsible, interconnected, community-focused, small-scale, and holistic. Similarly, permaculture, itself a form of slow agriculture, has increasingly been used as a metaphor and model for differential practices associated with the above listed qualities, as well as the, with the regeneration, healing, and care of society and of the non-human world. In contrast, the less widespread notion of thirdness has been resorted to in order to designate a set of undefined alternatives an open-ended trinary that is conceptualized with a view to counterbalancing the dominance of binaries, for instance, through selectively drawing from binaries to generate new alternatives. And I'm quoting here Edward Soja from 1996. So an example of that is um, filmmakers Fernando Solanos and Solana, sorry, and Octavio Gettino's concepts of third cinema which was a decolonial and anti-capitalist alternative to the two dominant film industries of the 1960s. On the one hand, Hollywood and its numbing blockbusters, and on the other hand, European art house, which was deemed bourgeois and author-centered. It's also the case of Third Landscape, which gardener and landscape theorist Gilles Clément describes as the sum of spaces left by humankind to na natural evolution, which express neither power or submission to power and belong neither to the territory of shadow nor to the territory of light, but to the margins of both shadow and light. In turn, urbanist Edward Soja describes his concept of third space, which draws from philosopher Henri Lefebvre's her spatial triad from 1991, as a term that disrupts, disorders, and begins to reconstitute the conventional binary opposition. The binary opposition being, in this instance, the concrete form, first space, versus the conceptual form, second space of speciality. Soja envisions third space as a place for encounters between subjectivity and objectivity, the abstract and the concrete, the real and the imagined, the knowable and the unimaginable, the repetitive and the differential, structure and agency, mind and body, consciousness and the unconscious, the disciplined and the transdisciplinary everyday life and an ending story, history. So the, the alternatives that uh, my PhD set out to explore share a lot of characteristics with these notions of slowness and thirdness. Slowness in their local and connection-seeking foci, in the practice of commoning, and in the aspiration to holism. Thirdness in their resistance to binary thinking, in their bearing of multiple identities, and in their ambiguous, in their being ambiguous, elusive, fragmented, impermanent, and latent. My PhD research is a study of alternatives created in response to educational, cultural, and socioeconomic inequalities since the late 19th century. These alternatives have emerged, disappeared, and re-emerged in particular conditions. They have been initially driven and eventually burdened by urgency and the quest to realize the impossible, which have variously led to their dissolution, morphing, or even compliance with what they initially stood against. This PhD is a stud study of the sporadic and time-limited nature of alternative spaces existing within, but not only, the UK charity and education sectors. And another question asked in my PhD is how the sectors are able and willing to support the production and maintenance of alternative spaces. So I've mentioned earlier that um, my uh, research evolved around three case studies. I'm describing them so you know a little bit what they are, and then we'll, they will be used to illustrate what I'm trying to talk about and the models I'm trying to kind of 
look at to combat calcification. Um, so the first one was Toynbee Hall. It, it was a residential, well, it still exists today, but in a very different form. It was created in 19, 1884, sorry. It was a residential center for educational, social, and cultural work among the socially economically deprived in Whitechapel in East London. Um, Toynbee Hall supplied lodgings to recent university graduates who were known as the residents and made provision for a multitude of lectures, clubs, societies, and activities, many of which were delivered or hosted by the yeah. residents themselves. They were intended for local working classes and engaged with subjects ranging from political economy to science through, the, through to the appreciation of art. Central to Toynbee Hall's mission was the creation of an environment for cross-class encounters, the expansion of workers' knowledge and skills base, and last but not least, social reform and campaigning. Despite its many flaws, which I can't get into uh, much detail now, but there were many, the early decades of Toynbee Hall remained politically bold, socially energetic, educationally critical, and organizationally reactive. Toynbee Hall was a nest of often productive contradictions and frictions, whereby late Victorian progressive ecclesiasticism met radical left-wing politics with figures such as Vladimir, Put um, Vladimir Lenin <laughs> visiting the hall for tea and debate. The second one was Centre Press, which operated from 1971 to 2012 in the heart of Hackney as a multi-purpose community centre which integrated a bookshop, Hackney's first bookshop, which specialised in working class and black literature and studies, it also had a coffee bar, publishing activities, free meeting rooms for community groups, a reading center, and an advice center. Its philosophy was that the arts, youth, and community work, um, social work, and education itself are not separate entities invariably requiring separate institutions. They are relate related and interdependent. The premise of Center Price was set up in um, 1969. The founders gave themselves three years to put the project in place and let it be taken over by the local community or fold. They stuck to their word with the support um, from Centre Prize's aid trustees, which were ex exclusively middle class and professional, uh, and were chosen for the convenience of the project, initially to add respectability to the early stages and let, later by allowing smooth transition to community control." End of quote. In 1974, the charity they had established became a cooperative, a working model which was a political, a political statement in itself, in their own words, and it would, lead, it would be led according to participatory, grassroots, democratic, and non-hierarchical principles, at least in theory. The last one um, was Open Coulis, which opened a year after the closure of uh, Center Prize. Uh, very close to Center Price, uh, and also inherited quite a lot of the users and participants of Center Price. Um, it was set up as an independent art school and community space in Hackney and later in Margate. It's still active today. It's an arts education charity which was founded in 2013. Um, and my study concentrates on the first eight years uh, of its existence, which coincides with my involvement as a co founder and director of the organization. And its activities have ranged from one-year development and learning programs for adults and young people to a weekly arts class for children through to participatory art projects, creative workshops, courses, philosophy seminars, etc. The organization's dual mission is to support early career artists in developing and sustaining their practice and to enable young people and adults to acquire skills and know-how and shape their voice shape their voice, creative and otherwise, through active and situated learning. So the temporal focus of this trinal study is on the organization's infancy and early years, which I consider the most hopeful, perhaps also most radical. I don't know about open school list. It could be more radical. I'm hoping for it that it will be. When the organizations were still finding their feet, experimenting with formats and practices and eluding predictability. So why connect them? Because despite the significant differences, they are bound by a shared commitment to educational access, cultural democracy, and local social change, and by their alignment with socialist politics. 
The three organizations have strive, strived to provide access to knowledge and culture to those without educational and or cultural privilege, and all have a reason and or developing response to the social, economic, and cultural neglect of a particularly particular geographic area and the disempowerment of particular communities at a particular moment in British politics. So in the late 19th century, in the 70s, and in the 2010s. So the multivision, multipurpose, and multi-public nature of these three organizations distinguishes them from the more common model by which schools serve students through the means of learning activities. Community centers, on the other hand, serve members of the local community through the means of social and cultural inclusion activities. And then on the other hand of the spectrum, cultural centers serve spectators, viewers, and all participants through the means of artistic experiences and activities. In contrast, these three organizations, Toynbee Hall, Enterprise, and Open Schoolist, provided activities and programs that were simultaneously engaged with learning, social inclusion, and the provision of cultural and artistic experiences, and that concurrently served people of diverse generations, classes, cultures, and communities of interest, amateurs and professionals, and locals and non-locals. Central to the three case studies mission was the creation and the maintenance of a space for the cohabitation of diverse uses, publics, and sociabilities. Users converged in one building, perhaps not all at the same time and perhaps in their own dedicated spaces, but nonetheless with the recognition that they belonged, for a time at least, to a community of users of that building, of that organization. So the organizational model that's, and that was under scrutiny in this research tends towards versatility, agility, and openness, and away from constraint, tradition, and commercial interest. It leans towards an ideal of alternativeness, a determination to operate differently, unexpectedly, holistically, and in a reactive manner rather than by design. Specifically, this model is characterized by a small staff with generalist and or multitasking skills, spatial flexibility with rooms often hosting a number of unconnected activities on different days of the week, an informal and often participant-led approach to programming and delivery, an agenda in flux responding to needs, circumstances, and events as they occur, and last but not least, material instability. Put differently, and in a nutshell, the type of organizations uh, this thesis is inquiring into is non-specialist, collaborative, reactive, nimble, and grassroots. Its informal, open-ended, and ever-evolving nature, so crucial to its ethos, can also place a strain on both its human resources and ability to sustain itself financially. So what I've done in this thesis is I've identified and highlighted the qualities of multi-public educational and cultural spaces, as well as their limitations and hurdles, from hope, overwork and precarity to failure and consistency. In observing the distance traveled by Toynbee Hall, Enterprise, and Open Schoolist, I've touched on the quasi inevitable institutionalization. In all three cases, institutionalization implied the difficulty to reflect the intended values in their practices, a difficulty that increased with the passing of time and that with, which comes with it again processes of habituation, temptation, or pressure to scale up, ethos bending from raising exercises, long tenure as well as a desire for stability and sustainability. And in what comes next, I analyze some of the symptomatic challenges encountered by organizations in their life cycles, which when accumulated, contribute to the misalignment between values and practices. In management and organization theory, Jeffrey Miles observes the life cycles a life cycle of organizations and the potential difficulties encountered along the way in the following terms. Newly born organizations suffer a liability of newness in that they have to learn how to survive and must create successful patterns of operations despite having limited resources. Slightly older organizations can suffer a liability of adolescence in that they can survive for a time on their initial store of resources, but then the failure rate tends to follow an inverted U-shaped pattern at, as they age. And all the organizations can suffer a liability of obsolescence if their operations are highly inertial and unchanging and become increasingly misaligned with their environment. So just to relate that back to the two organizations to give you a bit of context, 
um, and perhaps just center prize and open school is to get more quickly to my point. Starting with center prize, the organization did not suffer liability of newness, possibly because of its founders' decisions to call for its end after three years, in case there was no sufficient interest from uh, the local community to take over. However, it did suffer a liability of adolescence, having run its cooperative model on the high for a number of years, discontent, frustration and disagreement started to make space for irreversible changes. The cooperative having been dissolved and replaced by a pyramidal management model, it then took a few years before the organization suffered the liability of obsolescence, whereby few users and stakeholders still believed in the necessity of enterprise's existence. In the following decades, which was um, in the 2000s, the organization hung by a thread and operated at a fraction of its former capacity, barely holding on to its original value values until its eventual demise. When it comes to open schoolies, and I can talk a bit more specifically about it, perhaps in the Q&A, the organization suffered the liability of newness when attempting to maintain itself financially before be, be, beyond the first generous, though one of subsidy by the Barbican Center in Great London. So open schoolies was founded thanks to a £100,000 grant. Uh, and that kept us, kept us going with um, the kind of research and development time and the first year of the programs. But then very quickly, we were fundraising for the future of an organization that barely existed and still had very little to show for itself, which proved to be an extreme challenge and demanded extra energy and, and, remuner and rem remunerated labor from both staff and trustees. The self-imposed pressure to exist beyond the initial funding period set a precedent for time dedication above and beyond the call of duty and for multitasking and fighting, which would become the norm and be expected of incoming members of staff. The liability of newness manifested in a culture of overwork that one might retrospectively label as toxic and which to this day, and according to reports from former colleagues and newcomers, is still hard to overcome. So in an attempt to try and answer the question, what does it take to remain alternative? In what comes next, I set out to examine approaches that work to divert the common fate of alternatives from, morph from morphing into what they initially stood against. These approaches include scheduled overhaul or closure, plan failure, and institutional psychotherapy. I'm not going to go into great depth. I mean, this is another PhD in itself. Um, but what I, you know, I'm, I'm opening the, out these subjects for um, potentially more research in the future. So starting with scheduled overhaul or closure. So as I mentioned, Centerprise was conceived as a three-year project by its founders who would have not shied away from closing the organization had it not been taken over by a cooperative of, a, of local residents. And I have covered what happened after and elsewhere I've suggested that Centerprise may have taken a less bitter turn had the cooperative considered its lifespan or that of its membership from the start of its rule. When it comes to Open School East, it was conceived with the only certainty that it should exceed the year-long the, the year um, uh, project initially supported by uh, the two funders, the Barbican Centre and Create London because time was believed to be necessary not only to build and maintain relationships, um, meaningful relations with local residents and users, but also to allow the programs to become a credible and recognizable art educational alternative for the recipients as they move toward, forward with their practices and careers. So here I'm going to draw mostly on an event that connected to um, Open School East to develop an argument in favor of scheduled overhaul or closure. So I conducted an interview with a former chair and current trustee of Open School East Board called Justin O'Shaughnessy, uh, who reminisced of a period back in late 2016, during which the organization was preparing to move to Margate on the Kent Coast and was looking to acquire a building. So we found a building which was um, worth 600,000 pounds a trustee of Open School East was willing to buy and donate that building to Open School East. And some, some of us believe that securing ownership of space would um, 
provide uh, an opportunity for long-term sustainability. Justin O'Shaughnessy, who had worked on capital projects with not necessarily very happy turns, was resistant to the idea and warned those in favor of the endeavor against the burden that would generate. Open schoolists would have to fundraise for an equally large amount of money to refurbish and maintain the building at a time when it barely had the capacity to carry out its day-to-day -day tasks. The organization would have had to rely on income generation from subletting spaces. A full-time building manager would be needed to to, for the upkeep of the building and to manage the tenants, all of which would distract open schoolies from doing the work that was embedded in its mission, that is to support emerging practitioners and individuals from further afield in accessing a free art education. So instead of buying a building, it was proposed that the £600,000 uh, could be split over a period of 10 years, £60,000 a year, securing much needed annual uh, unrestricted funding for open schoolies operation. In Justin O'Shaughnessy's view, continuing to treat open schoolists as a meanwhile space instead of associating it with a fixed building that could become, that would become the institution was the only way for the organization to keep to its mission and to the scale it was built on, both of which made up open schoolies identity and reflected its intended values as a nimble, versatile, self-reflexive and reactive organization that would be as light on its feet as possible. So when I spoke to uh, Justin O'Shaughnessy, when I was kind of writing about this in my PhD, he suggested that the end of this funding, the 10 years of £60,000, should mark the conclusion of the organization's life. So this was a provocation more than anything else, um, but one that had the potential of generating thoughts, reactions, and a discussion on the relevance of an organization at any given time. So... He, we, we were talking about it and, and said, what will open schoolists look like in 10 years? Will it still be relevant? Could it become something else altogether? Does it still need to be there? When asked um, if he would have introduced the idea of a scheduled closure, um, if open schoolists hadn't been, in his own words, only three steps away from collapsing because of its over-reliance on individuals, he posited that this exercise in self-reflection, um, which could lead institutions which are struggling and a bit fossilized to decide to close down and to allow for the redistribution of money to other new organizations with fresh ideas. He argued that this should be carried out um, by every institution. And when we started thinking about the arts organization established in the last few decades, which haven't overcome the liability of obsolescence, but are nonetheless still going, we could not come up with a single organization that had chosen to bring its operation to a close. Those that did close, were those which had kept going until funding and income opportunities had completely dried up. Burdened by the sense of failure, they often closed quietly, silently, their website disappearing off the surface of the internet, leaving few traces behind and making their archives unavailable. And yet reading about experiences of closure, whether it's forced or deliberate, might help circumvent the idea that ceasing to exist is failing. So in the next part, I turn to Jack, then Judith Alberstam's question, what kinds of rewards can failure offer to us? <clears throat> Plan failure. So working to dismantle the logics of success in, and failure in a book about alternative modes of knowing and being, a book about failing well, failing often, and learning in the words of Samuel Beckett, how to fail better. Alberstam starts from the observation that success may require too much effort and be best replaced by failure. And I'm quoting, under certain circumstances, failing, losing, forgetting, unmaking, undoing, and becoming, not knowing, may in fact offer more creative, more cooperative, more surprising ways of being in the world. They ask, what kinds of reward can failure offer us? Perhaps most obviously, failure allows us to escape the punishing norms that discipline behavior and manage human development with the goal of delivering us from unruly childhoods to ordinary or orderly and predictable adulthood. Failure preserves some of the wondrous anarchy of childhood and disturbs the supposedly clean boundaries between adults and children, children, winners and losers. And while failure certainly comes accompanied by a host of negative effects, such as disappointment, disillusionment and despair, it also provides the opportunity to use these negative effects to poke holes in the toxic positivity of contemporary life. 
So Albert Stamps' understanding of the term failure as constructive, politically meaningful, and an interesting part of a collective learning process has informed and all given credibility to a number of discussions dedicated to the subject of failure, vulnerability, and the re refusal to abide by the metrics of success. In particular, um, there's a scholar and writer called Ir Irving J. Hunt, who's deployed the term plan failure in his analysis of the YNCL, um, an organization. So I'm saying YNCL, I'm going to say the word once. It was the it was an organization that was set up uh, in Upper Harlem in 1930. It was called the Young Negroes Cooperative League. I don't feel I want to say this word in my position, so I've decided to shorten it to YNCL, and we can discuss it why after. But um, the word um, is too sensitive for me to pronounce it. But there is an historical context. It was the 30s. It was set up by two. Black people, a journalist and an activist, George Schuller and Ella ba Baker in um, Upper Harlem. So Schuller and Baker worked towards establishing a mass movement led by young Black people in response to what they saw as the failures of contemporary Black leaders who had supplied, in Schuller's own words, no program capable of emancipating Black people from subversancy, insecurity, insults, debauchery, crime, disease, and this. So that's cited in Irvin J. Hunt. So in 1930, Schuller wrote the manifesto, an appeal to young Blacks, in order to enlist people between the ages of 16 and 35 to help launch a cooperative wholesale, a cooperative bank, a production plant where we shall start to produce some of the many commodities we consume, as well as a cooperative housing department and a permanent cooperative college. As Hunt explains, achieving economic independence was the mean by which to protect the Black population against racial violence at large, from arbitrary incarceration to sexual assault. By 1935, so five years later, the YNCL had set up base in 22 cities and 20 states, including California, New York, Washington, D.C., South Carolina, Carolina, Virginia, etc. Each base known as councils incorporated buying clubs and grocery stores. When the young people would reach the age of 36, they would have to resign to make space for younger souls. So in his reading of the league, Hunt put forward the, uh, the concept of planned failure, not to confuse with planned obsolescence and reinvention, he warns us, but as the performative codification of strategic anarchy, the synchronized operation, the cooperation of two affective drives, a love for the world, thus a desire for its preservation, and the sense that the world must come to an end for the world to have a chance, for property to be dismantled, and for shared freedom to be born. Plan failure designates the intended demise of the original plan. It assumes that to maintain the structure of a movement's organization, which is made up not only of social arrangements, but also the constitution of its political subjects is necessarily to reinforce the very problems one sought to escape, the distribution of property according to hierarchies of race, class, class, race, and gender. In other words, to plan a social movement's failure is to plan for it not to succeed in the accepted sense of the term, for success, in Hunt's view, almost inevit inevitably entails compliance, compromise, conciliation, formalization, regularity, property, centralization, and institutionalization. The YNCL was set up to resist this predicament and unsettle both dominant conception of what it means to succeed at anti-capitalist resistance and the metrics of measurements commonly employed to assess that success. Schuller, so one of the two co-founders, himself was 35 years old when he wrote the manifesto, and thus he was planning to reside from the League soon after launching it, because he was of the view that older people had a tendency to lean towards centralized planning and as such were unable to engage with cooperative organizing without imposing both their experience and their authority. Schuller and Baker hoped that enlisting young people would optimize the chances for the League to disengage with the process of eventually reproducing the dominant system's defects. As Hunt posits, the young in the league, in the league's name, signifies the avowal of failure and the refusal of longevity. 
Schul and Baker sought to set up a transient, small-scale and decentralized councils with a view to elude the notions of longevity and success, which are too often thought of as synonymous. Hunt asks, what social movement come into view when these are not made synonymous and when success do not, does not de depend on schemas of duration? So brought back in the context of the three studied organizations, Toynbee Hall, Centerprise, and Open Schoolist, plan failure is incompatible with permanence, settled, settledness, and thus the acquisition of brick and mortar and overbearing affiliation with the building. So that concept is irrelevant to Toynbee Hall because um, it had a building, um, it had a very slow turnover of wardens, um, one person stayed for like 40 years, um, the residents sometimes um, chose to stay for decades, and the identity of Toynbee Hall was very much defined by its building. But it is more compatible, so that concept of plant failure is more compatible with Centerprise and its three-year overtaking challenge, and with Open Schoolies, which ultimately made the decision to remain unburdened by the responsibility of owning a building, but nonetheless had a, a slow turnover of directors. I stayed eight years, I stayed too long. People told me, if, you try and, if you're running a radical space, you have to leave after five years. I couldn't leave because I didn't want the space to collapse. I wanted it to exist. I wanted to have secure lease, secure funding, make, make it sustainable. But then the sustainability of open school is also killed open school is in the sense that I left an institution and no longer a DIY, um, you know, well, we can talk about it later, but for me, um, open school is became exactly what I didn't want it to become, and I didn't want to work there anymore by the end. Um, ultimately, if plan failure shares some of its quality with the idea of a scheduled overhaul or closure, it does more in its negation to achieve governability. As Hunt puts it, planned failure is an ecstatic, ecstatic makeup and breakup, a mode of being out of a body while never more in it. So what can we learn from the YNCL's planned failure? If there's an element of absurdity and aberration, i.e. the exclusion of anyone over the age of 35, regardless of their ability to continue cooperating, a few tools can be taken away from this approach from the re-evaluation re of how success is measured and understood to the unsettling of the preconception that success and longevity are necessarily synonymous through to the attention placed on maintaining the energy, flows, and ecstatic quality of an organization. So moving on to the final parts, um, final model uh, for a differential organization, um, Institutional psychotherapy as applied to school of art and design. Themes of institutional overhaul and plan failure connect also to questions of institutional identity and possibilities of institutional psychotherapy. So that final section takes on the institutional approach of Laurence Rassel, a cultural organizer and cyber feminist who has held positions in a lot of different environments, the latest of which is LERG, École de Recherche Graphique, a graduate school of art and design school in Brussels. When she applied for the post of director in 2016, Hassel wrote an institutional project informed by a background in copyleft and open source practices, a feminist heritage, and the training she undertook in the field of institutional psychotherapy shortly before taking on her job. Along with a desire to give back to culture and education their speculative function, a project consisted in turning the school that she had inherited and which showed multiple signs of dysfunction and malaise into a place of transparency, collaboration, co-construction and co-responsibility. And the main point of reference was the psychiatric clinic of Laborde in Courcheverny, France, founded in 1953 by the psychiatrist Jean Houry, who would be then joined by a number of figures, including the Felis, um, philosopher Félix Guattari and the educator Fernand Deligny. So the Laborde Clinic distinguished distinguish itself from other institutions for breaking down the duality between patient and carer and for in involving patients in every aspect of the clinic's operation, from cooking and cleaning to participating in meetings through to contributing to its newspaper and therapeutic club. So since she took her functions um, six years ago, Rassel's approach has first involved 
in inverted commas, imposing the collective in her own words, that is to say rallying staff members from across the administration and pedagogical strata of the school, as well as interested students, to participate in the shaping of institutional change, um, notably through the creation of a number of committees and groups. So she uses the word to impose, to impose the collective, in reflection of the fact that not every staff member was willing to engage with that collective decision-making process and in the bridging of disciplines uh, and of the different uh, programs that were offered by the school. Rassel's so-called imposition is more an ideal than a directive in that staff members were not compelled to take part in the collective process, but some did choose to leave uh, if they were satis dissatisfied with the institution um, new culture. Uh, other approaches have included making decisions, budget and processes transparent and accessible on the website, using open source methodologies to approach the rewriting of the rigid decree um, which regiments the school and to embed within this decree the co-construction and transparency projects, which then could be changed after a departure uh, if others wanted that. She's also switched the working times of the cleaning staff with their approval from night to day in order to visibilize the labor and make them part of the fabric of the school. And she's also um, set up and opened up formerly inaccessible spaces, rethinking the atmosphere of the place, um, as well as enacting very simple gestures, changing, such as changing the way doors open. Do they open this way or do they open this way? What does that mean when they push someone out or when they invite someone in? Or keeping doors open in places that are traditionally uninviting, such as the director's office. As she explained in an essay that she wrote uh, as part of her training, a motivation to concern herself with the topic in the first place, the topic of institutional psychotherapy in the first place, was to think about another relation to the institution, other than principles of efficacy, profitability, arbitrary authority, and or paternalism. The violence of these principles is experienced by bodies and in the relations to relationships of cultural workers, but also in the type of programs that are undertaken and in the type of relations to the public who is essentially considered as consumer. This relationship is measured quantitatively, numbers of visitors, money raised, number of friends on social media, etc., rather than qualitatively. I continue to quote her. I would like to take on the direction of an institution according to principles that take into account the collective care, a structure that is collaborative, open, process-oriented, with exchanges, transmission, and the distribution of possibles in mind. If Rassel aims for the construction of a commons within the space of the school, she's also very clear about her status as a director and the fact that she's ultimately responsible for all decisions that are taken. While she's a utopian, she does not engage in conversations about horizontality, being ultimately accountable to the board of the school and aware of the pre precarity of her institutional project and of its legacy. She has been resetting the institution to allow for a more open approach in present and present and future, and has made it clear all along that she is not the institution. She works in and with the institution, but has separated her authority, desires, and commitments from the school's identity. It's kind of unusual for, for school sometimes. When I left open schoolies, I'm returning now to this idea of permaculture. When I left Open School East in 2021, I turned in part to horticulture and garden design. I've been training in this field for a year and a half, which have in turn led me to pay attention to the entanglements between nature and its plants, lives and cycles um, and education, and then to research nature-based pedagogies. At the beginning of this um, talk, I addressed the slow movement and bear my culture. I chose the term slow, among others, to signify the differential and suggested that besides opposing ac accelerationism, slow stands for sustainable, responsible, interconnected, community focused, small scale, and holistic. And I further pointed to the fact that permaculture, which is a form of slow agriculture, has increasingly been used as a metaphor and model for differential practices associated with this qualities, as well as the, with the regeneration, healing, and care of society. In the framework of my research, I visited Jean Rakovic, who is the director of pedagogy at the 
École Domaine du Possible, which is translated School of the Realm of the Possible, which is located in the natural region of the Camargue in the southeast of France. That's a drawing from the school. It's a pretty accurate drawing. Um, it welcomes, so the school wel welcomes about 100 pupils aged between 3 and 16. It's accredited by the Ministry of Education and Agriculture. It was established in 2015 on a 335 acre domain. And soon following um, the, the school itself uh, was an agroecological farm and an ethology focused equine center, which have since constituted uh, key learning resources for the school. So you see a very, at the entrance um, on the right, a very, that's the equine center, that's the permaculture farm, then there's a forest, there's a field, uh, and then, you know, all sorts of classrooms, a kitchen, um, all sorts of things. And they have a lot of events they open to the public. The school places eco-citizenship at the center of its pedagogy, along with a transdisciplinary and intergenerational approach. And when I spoke to the director of pedagogy, he talked of the school as an exercise in permaculture, which I thought was interesting and, and has gained currency since. And perhaps um, it is worth noting that Rudolf Steiner, who was a pioneer in alternative pedagogy um, in the early 20s, um, actually, yeah, late 19, early 20th century, um, also spearheaded the biodynamic agriculture movement, which bears a number of connections to permaculture. So permaculture and education and alternative pedagogy are quite connected in a way uh, through him, but also through experiments like this one. If permaculture is concerned with ideas of re regeneration, interdependence, so for example, companion planting, holistic attention to each and every aspect of an ecosystem, as well as community resilience, then one could argue that these principles align in several ways with those of the model of organizations that I have been researching here. The term permaculture signifies the permanence of agriculture. The scale of permanence, was a tool that was developed um, in Australia in the 1950s and is considered the backbone of agriculture. It includes, um, so it's a scale of eight um, uh, items, climate, landform, water supply, roads, trees, permanent buildings, subdivisional fences and soil. This backbone is not a blueprint. Um, as agriculture writer Tara Hammonds argues, the basic idea is that as one moves down the list, the elements of a farm system become less permanent. That is, they take less energy to change and are less permanent as a factor for planning. If the larger social context is macro and more rigid, permaculture works towards a local and more specific context of where the design is located and related to, thus lending itself to more micro and flexible approaches. And as a potential future line of inquiry, and in, a li in, an anal ala sorry, in alignment with the research of a curator uh, and a writer, Guillaume Desange, who is the author of that little treaty, translated, was not translated yet, um, small treaties of institutional permaculture for a living and productive site for contemporary creation. I would therefore want to ask, what can multi-public educational and cultural organizations learn from permaculture? What would institutional permaculture look and feel like? And in the same vein, I would want to grapple with the inherent tensions between, on the one hand, the necessity and desire for sustainability to combat the damage incurred by market capitalism versus the non-fixity and time limitedness of the alternative spaces that have been the object of this study and which too work against the patterns of market capitalism. So the author of this uh, pamphlet, Guillaume Desange, is the director of the Palais de Tokyo in Paris, Europe's largest art center. He took over as a director in January, 2022. Um, it's a space that is incredibly large, budget draining and energy consuming. And in this pamphlet, he first postulates that a permacultural institution is an institution that works and thinks ecologically rather than an institution that takes ecology as a subject. A permacultural approach, according to him, is a positive way of rethinking the mission and functionings of an institution following a logic of permanence and sustainability. He writes, 
Beyond the themes of exhibitions and actions connecting to reusing, recycling, and minimizing the institution's carbon footprint, permaculture infuses its spirit in the institution as a whole, its governance, communication, building, programs, management, funding, etc. Importantly, it reminds us that the basis of permaculture is to reconsider time and space in ways that are ingenious and optimizing. And this is a, an example of a, a map um, with zones, kind of taking um, permaculture zoning, a technique of division of land um, according to crops, activities, and rotations. And he uses this metaphor to um, redefine the spaces of the institution and thinking, what if we treated a large institution or a small institution like we treat a piece of land that we're transforming into a permaculture farm? How would the spaces look like and how could we diversify their use? So for example, we could have, and that's what he states, spaces for the slow germination of ideas and projects, spaces for denser use, by people, by objects, for example, a printing press, spaces that may be private for a while, but then rotate and become semi-public or, or public for another while thereafter. All, the, all this with the idea of optimizing the institutional spatial resources, all the while looking after the building and its users. So a, a few of his uh, proposals or, or the things he advocates for in his treaties are, um, First, he advocates for the regular recirculation of existing forms, practices, and ideas when relevant. He challenges the idea that art is limitless and that art shouldn't be co contrived because the, the Palais Tokyo as, a, as an approach as a, is very much known to have put on extravagantly expensive and environmentally inhospitable exhibitions to achieve a wow factor for audiences and to please ego-driven artists and funders. He also challenges the competition that has been at play since the opening of Palais Tokyo in 20, uh, 2002, which you might know, organizations comp compete with each other. Who is going to be the first one to show Animov, for example, and it's going to be a race, and that's how they work rather than talking to each other. He also talks about local distribution networks. Why choose an artwork in, that is in New York when you can have a similar, perhaps not as outstanding, but no less significant artwork in the southwest of France? without going into kind of a, 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 a lo the local as the new moral. It talks about intellectual compost, how the, how the unused ideas and research which are generated in the making of a project or exhibition can be kept somewhere digitally or physically to amalgamate, brew, ferment and compost in order to possibly come out in future in one form or another. It describes this as creating fuel for, the pro for future projects naturally enriched and refined, a recycling operation that emulates the virtual circle of nature, whereby everything that dies feeds what comes next. Last but not least, he addresses the act of taking care of people, employees, freelancers, subcontracted workers, and not just of artists, to fight, fight against the invisible violence, precarity, stress, overwork, which are considered as inherent to the practice um, of artistic professions. So some of these ideas are not new. Some might be a bit banal or a bit um, nostalgic or appropriative of a, of a type of agricultural practice that we could be critical of because permaculture is not a given. Um, it's not achievable by, by everyone. You need to have land. You need to have capital. You need to be ready to um, give up some subsidies which are made for intensive agriculture. Um, so there's a... Yeah, there's, there's some yeah, access and privilege for this type of practices are uh, to be questioned as well. Nonetheless, there are a few important points in what in what you discuss. Um, and no doubt um, you know, this will feature in new institutional discourses soon. But the questions are how to push this further. And if this is to become the new norm, then um, in the same way that permaculture is becoming the new norm, then what alternatives may arise to defeat that future normativity? I'll stop here. Um, so before, uh, thank you, Anna. That was like quite, quite a long and 
uh, detailed, <laughs> but I think you threw up a lot of issues. So I'm going to ask you a few um, questions which are going to capture the, the main issues. Before I get into that, um, with the register, can I just check that it's circulating? Where is it? Over there? Okay. So keep it going. If your name is not on the register, just write it in where your program is, and then you can also sign for last week if you haven't done that already. If you haven't done that, then do that next week. So we'll, we'll fumble our way through it. Um, so that, that, there was a lot involved in that, so thank you. Um, and I think you threw up quite a few challenges for us in terms of the kind of, uh, I'd say even the, the sort of idea of what a, the programs that we have here at Goldsmiths are, but I think that also captures uh, or reflects certain expectations of uh, kind of certainly the commercial art world, but the kind of parts of the art world are attached to the commercial art world as well. So you were very clear about um, the institutions you're interested in throw up alternatives. And they're not just social and political alternatives, they're also artistic alternatives and alternative forms of practice. So I've got two questions, which are quite large. Um, and then uh, uh, I'm going to throw it open after that. So, so the, f the first question is actually about the um, uh, kind of political economy of the institutions that you're describing and that you're interested in and the ones they're responding to. So what I understood you to be advocating for was a kind of organic, horizontal, you're not obviously not happy with those uh, terms? Um, <laughs> organic, yes, uh, horizontal and, and species of... Transversal? Yeah. All right, good. All right, let's stick with transversal. <laughs> Um, like a, kind of just a, a sort of form of collaboration. So a lot of the terms that you use uh, that you kind of endorse, like flexibility, responsiveness, collaboration. I don't think you said emergent, but it wouldn't surprise me if that was part of it. A kind of decentralized type of uh, organization. Um, that, that suggests a kind of you know, um, certainly cooperative type of movement. You can sort of feel... Reson I could feel resonances of a uh, kind of socialist endeavor with that hierarchy and so on. And there's a kind of utopic element to that, right? So it seemed to me that there was th the, the difficulties you're describing in maintaining that type of initiative was a very good and instructive lesson for all of us in thinking about um, how to keep those wishes and those promises going when you're confronted with the reality of like, how do we fund this? Who do we get to do this? What building do we do we do we do this in? How do we keep the building going? How do we, especially now, how do we pay for the bills? And so on. So there's a very nice kind of um, conversion of some dreams and aspirations into a concrete reality, which obviously has exhausted you many times. <laughs> and also given you a great deal of pleasure and satisfaction in the initial moment of hope that I think Miles talks about um, and I'll, in, the, in the kind of early, the early moment. Um, but also costs a lot as well for the people who are doing it. So you talk about overworking, which is really common in the art system and so on. And I guess my question around it is, um, well, firstly, I think there's, there's something quite important in terms of how people translate the sort of uh, ideas and sort of political or social or collaborative visions that we often speak about and endorse in the teaching here um, into the aftermath of being in a program like this. I have a second question about the criteria for success, which I'll, I'll come to later on. But what I wanted to ask about, um, actually maybe I'll ask that one first and I'll come to the, to the political economy question second. So what, what interests me is how do, we, how do we think about success in these terms? Because my sense is that um, the model, certainly on the fine art MFA, um, and I don't know about the curating MFA because I'm never invited to teach on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I'll leave that to one side. Um, certainly on the fine art MFA, the model we have is still very much of individual artists who is kind of after the program thrown out into the, the art field. You kind of make your way, you get a gallery, you do some shows, you get a gallery. So it's a very kind of individuated type of model. Uh, and I think all of our teaching supports that model. Um, but in the discussion of planned failure and in the discussion of 
um, sustainability. Yeah. And but you're not walking out on me. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, sorry, just triggering me with that kind of... Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, guess, I guess the question is really, what, what's the idea of ambition and um, success if we, if we put planned failure into, into the model? So ambition, and I, I, think, I think this is uh, a kind of legacy of that sort of YBA Goldsmiths moment where the idea was that you would come to Goldsmiths, you get MFA, you get sort of stamped, galleries would come in, they'd pick you up, and then like, I don't know, you'd be you know, showing in New York and all over the place uh, in short order. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but sometimes it does, and it keeps that model going. Um, but you're, you're suggesting that basically that, that model is unsustainable and is tied in with like lots of you know, things we all understand very well about forms of gentrification, sort of neoliberal economies that the art world kind of thrives off now. It's not really sustainable ecologically, so on and so forth. It, it seems to me a lot to give up any notion of ambition. And I don't think that's what you're suggesting, but it seems like there's a conversion in what we understand artistic ambition might be if we, with, with this kind of planned failure built into the artistic model, and also the curators and some artists. It's a very multi-layered question. It's, it's hard to answer because I guess what I'm, I was looking at were institutions. Um, and here you're talking more about kind of a model, like a pedagogical model and programs within an institution. And the reason why I've dealt with small-scale institutions is that there's a form of control as to what um, directions they can take. It, you know, they, they are... Change can be implemented quite fast if you only have five people working. Goldsmiths cannot um, be, you know, cannot be changed from one day to another because a couple of trustees and the director decides, or it can be, you know, it can be, you know, the, the impact is quite different. So I'm going to try and answer this question differently. I guess perhaps I'll take a concrete example of something I'm working on at the moment. So there's a, there was the first curatorial program in Europe um, was the École du Magasin in Grenoble, attached to the Magasin Art Center, uh, which opened in 86. The school um, the curatorial program was opened in 87. And the idea was, France at this time was decentralizing uh, the art world and they were opening a lot of art centers outside of Paris and the main centers. Um, and they started a big network of regional firms for contemporary art with collections. And suddenly there were art centers everywhere, but no one trained to run these places. So they were like, we need to train these people. So they opened the school of the magasin. It was like a very political initiative. And they went on from 87 to 2016, a director who I share a lot of ideas with to cover Beatrice Jones. And she actually advocates also, she's in conversation with Guillaume Desanges about institutional planning, I'm in conversation with her, understood what she was trying to do. She was trying to create, change the model and say, it's no longer relevant to train. I mean, it was just, it was not just curators, but it, it was also artists, but it's no longer, longer relevant to train people to work in institutions which, which need reforming. So we're going to do something very different. We're going to work with um, social workers, artists, um, you know, all sorts of people, cultural practitioners, and we're going to start a new program. And she renamed the school. It went on for four years, and then it was defunded. She left. It was complicated. COVID happened. And it didn't work out. There, was, there were a lot of crises. And, um, I've been asked to revive that school or help them find a way to revive that school. And, um, and I'm thinking, you know, it, 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 there's a nostalgia around, oh, this was the first curatorial program before the Royal College of Art, before the Apple, before Goldsmiths, you know, this is history, let's just, you know, let's revive it, let's be proud. 
you know, at the end of the day, there were some great moments, and a lot of great people came through that program. But also, it was not great and very conventional for many years, and, and not very active. So, you know, my first approach is, I don't want to do to make the same mistakes that, as open school is. I don't want to think, I want this school. I'm just, you know, consulting because of my interest, but I'm not thinking I want this school to look like that in 20 years. At this stage, I'm like, I want to create a model for three years and then stop, and then take stock of that model. And then perhaps start all over again, or perhaps, you know, just work in a way that we're not considering. I mean, again, this idea that success is longevity mm -hmm. and success is succession is not necessarily interesting to me now. Um, I think in order to remain agile and, um, and free, we need to not commit to something too big that will need more funding as years go, that will be expected to get bigger and, you know, and to do more and more partnerships and it will get out of hands. And I believe in small scale. I mean, it's ironic that I work at Goldsmiths, but um, it's also because I was tired of working with small scale. I was like, I'm going to do something a bit different. Um, but I believe in in the small scale model in order for, yeah. I mean, what I enjoyed at Open School is was that we were listening to, we didn't call them students, we called them associates. Everything they criticized, they were over-critical and they were invited to be over-critical and everything they said which was realistic and could be implemented was implemented the day after and we just reformed the school year after year, month after month, day after day and um, you know it was very much student-centered. So I'm kind of interested in doing something small term or medium term. Um, three years is a good period of time because what I want to be focusing on is social practice and ecological practices, and what I call practical practices, I think, and I don't want this school to be for curators or artists, I'm thinking of it as kind of cultural producers, artists, um, and others, and curators, and others uh, who have an interest in kind of contributing to cultural production, um, and who want to um, take a stance socially and ecologically, you know, in light of what we're experiencing. And do you have a question? Yeah, of course. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess my uh, just just to come back to the same one, uh, and from a different angle, you're you're kind of talking institutionally, of course. That's where your yeah. your efforts yeah. have been, and like the model yeah. given is about what does institution do, and it's very different again to sort of this institution, which is like still keeping going, <laughs> you know, we will persist. Um, and we try and change our teaching model, it's very slow and this kind of stuff. So it's a very different ecology and a very different um, setting, I guess. I would say still different ambition. But I'm wondering if the same model applies not just for institutions, but individual practitioners as well. So whether in what you're advocating in terms of... So I guess there's kind of two models of permanence. One is just like, the autonomy, the autonomy artist model, which is like, I've made it and I keep going. And the kind of, you know, the, the effort of a career is to make sure that you stay visible, that you kind of always have a kind of front foot, that people pay attention to you. And there's a kind of demand for persistence in, in what you do. And almost, and I hear this a lot from people who are adopted by galleries, you, you kind of need to produce a product so people know what you do and they will get it. And the next one will be, another iteration of the same thing. And it's quite hard for people to swap out from doing that. Um, but I think the other, the other model of, of persistence or like permanence is more of this permaculture model, which seems to be more about the perpetuation of an ecosystem, which requires things to grow and then to die back, to move on. So the limited time scale is also, it serves a purpose for so long, and then it, then it has to vanish because it either starts dominating or it can't contribute to the ecosystem in a useful, productive way. And so, so, so what, I guess I'm wondering whether there's a way of thinking about a career, an artistic career, mm -hmm. uh, on, on those lines, which is not so much about, you know, you keep going with your product, essentially, or with your signature, your curatorial moment, 
um, but to kind of be a bit more responsive to the environments you find yourself in. And it seems to me that's really hard to... Um, it's, it's hard to set up because you're kind of committed to a relative obscurity if you do that, no? In, in, in that you kind of have to keep on changing and putting your environment. And there's something about the small scaleness which seems extremely different to the kind of traditional notion of a successful artist. Yeah. Or yeah. curator. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, one, one thing to say is that uh, you know, I live in a very small town and there's also a reason, you know, I'm, now I don't want to live in a big city and I think it's very hard for students to study in a big city like London. The competition is going to be massive, it's going to be very hard to break through, but also, you know, w w uh, take another example, when we moved open schoolies from London to Margate, in, in London we were, um, you know, a small fish in a big pond in, and or in, a, in an ocean, and mm. in Margate we were a big fish in a small pond. And you can, perhaps I'm advocating for people to be active um, more locally in smaller environments where what they do is made visible um, and what they do is valued because there's not a huge amount going on. London is just completely overwhelming. There's just so much going on, you know, too much of everything. It, it doesn't make it an interesting, but I think it's really hard to break through in this context. Um, and I think, yeah, so kind of looking after a smaller um, ecosystem. I mean, in, in a lot of... I have the feeling that a lot of students I meet, you know, in different contexts are not necessarily willing to be artists or curators at the end of their studies, and they are very active, you know, in a certain context with more kind of DIY activists or you're set, setting things up, you know, and I think that's the future. I mean, you're asking the wrong question because I'm, I'm not interested in the commercial art world. I, you know, I, I don't really go and see big shows anymore because I am completely bored by it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I hope curators who are younger than me kind of, you know, do that. Um, but it's hard to, it's hard to answer, the, you know, this question. I, I don't know. It's, it's a very I mean, I'm, not, I'm not asking you the questions because yeah, I, I endorse the big artist figure. Yes. I just think there's an interesting counter model presented by, by what you've pre There's an interesting counter model in what you've presented, uh, which suggests a different way of setting up an art scene. Yeah. And not just an art scene, but how art plugs into other types of activity and social organization. Um, but it seems to me that it also requires a different expectation of what it is to be an artist or curator yeah. than the ones that we're familiar with historically. Yeah, exactly. I think... Um, let me think for a second. You know, I, I always, you know, I mean, especially with curators when they ask, oh, you know, what, what's your top tip? And I'm like, well, I don't have a top tip, but just have an agenda. Be, be, Try and be consistent, um, and you know. I mean, you could be cynical. I'm talking. I'm addressing all of you. you. You could be cynical and saying, you know, what is lacking in the art world? What's lacking? What's lacking in the teaching at Goldsmiths, for example? What is lacking is sustainable practice. How do we make our practices sustainable uh, from an ecological and environmental point of view? But how do we make it sustainable from an economic point of view? These questions, I'm sure, they discuss within and among the students. They're not really addressed in the teaching. And, you know, so I see people producing, 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 you know, kind of using really unsustainable materials and thinking, and also kind of impoverishing themselves by spending money on materials and things. Um, there are other ways of doing things. Um, and I think we really need to, yeah, I, I think if you were engaging kind of thinking how, how to be how to practice sustainably, you'd be kind of pioneering something because so few people think about it. You know, this, you know, this, this university needs a, a course on, you know, I mean, I know there's an art and ecology 
Um, and maybe it's not it's more theoretical, it's not so much dedicated to actually how do we how do we contribute um, to how do we make play a small part in you know destroying the planet a bit less and how can our you know, practice kind of advocate for that and how how are we consistent with um, our values. Um, and yeah, I mean, kind of, uh, it's, it's not just that, but it's also how, how do we work sustainably with, say, communities, you know? I mean, again, um, a lot of people do social practice, but they have access to no training on how do you work with a vulnerable young adult who's got, you know, a learning disability? How do you work with a school child? Um, how do you work with organizations that are in a different sector and don't speak your language, and yet it would be so interesting to work with them and their participants, their users, their, you know. Um, so yeah, for me, this is also part of the, of the teaching. It, we need to train artists and curators and cultural producers today in, in a different way. They need to have this kind of multiple skills. Um, they need to be able to, you know, like when I set up Open School East, I didn't know anything about HR, about, you know, managing, and my management style was absolutely rubbish, you know, we basically, we exhausted ourselves, and because it was so important that they would survive, we exhausted everyone in the process, and that's my biggest regret, you know, um, and we never wanted to be bigger, but we just had to succeed, and no one ever asked, but what is the cost of that success? What are you asking people to do for this to be successful? What are you doing to yourself for this to be successful? So I, th I think we need to train artists today. <laughs> so there was a student last year who'd gone to business school and he was a bit embarrassed and he was like, oh yeah, I've been to business school between people curating. I was like, this is brilliant. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know you, you know how to make a budget, you know how to write a policy, you, you know how to um, deal with an issue around human resources, you know how to, you should be knowing these things. So we need different skills and a lot of what I do today is, uh, is working because I'm I'm becoming who I'm training as kind of some sort of landscape gardener, and I'm doing a lot of work with artists uh, in permaculture environments, in parks, in the outdoors, and I'm commissioning artists, designers, and others to make work that can sustain nature, that can be at the service of nature, and through sustainable means. But also, and there's something quite exciting for artists to learn how to well to 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 be given a brief, you know. Artists are rarely given a brief, and you ask something very specific. I want a compost bin. Design me something brilliant. Mm. And, you know, this is fun. Why am I saying that now? Because, um, you know, I'm, I'm also kind of learning um, new skills. I'm learning because I want to work in the natural environment. I'm not just fantasizing about, you know, the living world and the non human world and the <coughs> plant world. I'm actually understanding what, you know, what nature, how nature works. Um, so I can then guide people um, into working in this environment. And I think we just need to, you know, if anyone, if because I don't believe I'm less and less interested in working in institutions, in kind of museums, because I don't think they're public enough. I'm interested in working outdoors because that's more accessible, even though nature still has access issues, physical, uh, class, you know, um, gender, uh, you know, kind of, I mean, it's, it's not an inclusive space, but it's more inclusive than a museum. And so I'm attracted to working in this environment. And, um, sorry, I'm rambling now, but, yeah, I don't know. And it, it, I guess it's a way of, I th yeah, I think, you know, it, it, in that school, if I end up kind of devising it, I'll be training people how to, you know, work with, you know, people from civil society and be training people, whether they're artists or curators or anything else, and be training people to react and respond to a problem like there's an irrigation system that is deficient in this field. How do we deal with this through kind of ingenious and creative means? Um, so it's kind of learning how to co collaborate with other people who are making, you know, I mean, basically my, my relationship to art is very instrumental. I wanted to have a use, I wanted to to be useful. Um, so this is the kind of training I would want to see, like 
for everyone to be able at the end of a year to recognize at least three plants around them to be able to realize that what they're producing is not sustainable and what to replace um, you know, their production with. So it is to be able to read the budget, to be able to um, train in social care and in safeguarding, etc. So this is pushing it quite far, but I also think that, I mean, today, you know, it's either that or the art world, because I, I don't think, I don't think it's a, it's a very interesting world and it's contributing massively to, you know, pollution, waste, just, you know, that sort of things. All right, I'm sure there are some questions. It's one of them. I'm just gonna change the computers a bit. Yeah, okay. So, thanks for the talk. I'm interested in the relationship between the sort of small scale, creative, agricultural work and your uh, relationship to academia, having just completed a PhD. As someone who comes from a small town and is interested in working in those types of spaces, but is also obviously moved across the world to be in a large academic institution, things about doing a PhD as well. How do you see those two worlds like supporting each other? Like why do a PhD you want to do that type of work? Uh. I did a PhD because I was starting to work um, and develop open school lists with others, and I, re I realized that you know I, I could do with some time to read, to think, to have people to have conversations with. I also had a massive chip on my shoulder because I didn't study anything really rewarding. I studied arts management for my BA, and then I studied curating at the Royal College of Arts. And you say that again. <laughs> <laughs> if I'd studied here, it would have been different. Actually, it was a lot better here. I don't know why I went there. Um, but, um, and I just felt like, you know, I've not, everyone else had studied art history. Everyone was just so much smarter than me. I couldn't really read theory. And I was like, I wanted something, I just need to kind of, break through this kind of threshold. They're annoying me. They, I, I want to, you know, go a bit deeper. But also, I wanted to research, have time to research, um, and to deepen my uh, understanding of what we were creating and the genealogy of spaces like Open School East. And um, I applied for a PhD at the University of Nottingham in the School of Geography. and. Um, and I got funding and I was like, it's really interesting. I was criticized by a few people. I was like, I love the fact that the university is funding me to develop a, you know, an understanding and potentially not a new model because I don't think I've developed a new model, but that they were sponsoring an activity that was essentially not anti-university, but that was um, you know, doing something very different. I mean, Open School East was free. Open School East was transversal. We did teach. Um, um, Kind of social practice, it wasn't the only thing, but and I could see a lot of people saying, you know, I'm in the painting department, I'm not allowed to make a performance, I, I've, I've been penalized for, you know, doing a social practice project, no one understands what I'm talking about, I'm lost, you know, I pay X amount of money, and I was like, we need something different. So I like, I like this kind of, um, this contradiction, and basically they kind of sponsored, well, with a very small amount of money, but I got some money, um, I got a, a studentship. So they sponsored my effort to develop other models. And also, then I had, you know, the, the chance of being, the opportunity to be challenged by people in a department that is extremely porous and quite generous. You could go from one field to another, it didn't matter. Cultural geography is vast, it's like, you know, what, uh, cultural studies used to be, or perhaps still is. Um, so that was very permissive. And at the same time, everything I learned, I could implement into open schoolies, but I could also negate what, what I was learning by saying, no, that doesn't work. So, you know, it was a game of back and forth. And open schoolies was completely enriched by my PhD, and vice versa, my PhD was built on this kind of day to day experience. It was almost like a practice based PhD, even if it wasn't. And then, you know, very honestly, a, a series of burnouts, um, COVID came and I 
And I just wanted to leave the art world, retrain in horticulture and garden design. I wanted to do that. And some people were like, that's a shame because you've got this interest and you would miss not looking to artists. So why don't you try and combine everything? And a lot of projects I do today combine pedagogy, horticulture, commissioning, and, you know, and, um, and I, I applied for a job at Goldsmiths because um, why well, I needed an income. Um, but the, I guess the difference was I was and I'm still um, not involved with administration. I don't have to do fundraising. I don't have to do management. I, I can just teach. I can just talk to the students. I can just concentrate on content, and that's really rich. But um, and, and then you start, it's, there's an attraction with academia in the sense that, um, I don't know. I mean, Goldsmiths is, is a difficult place, as we all know, but it's also an incredibly interesting place with incredibly interesting people. And it feels like um, the right place. And it's the nearest interesting university to the town where I live. Um, so I couldn't have a job at the Royal College, otherwise I'd, be, I'd have to move back to London, which I couldn't afford. Um, but not that I can afford commuting to Goldsmiths either. <laughs> not on my salary, but... Um, <laughs> Actually, when I first took the job, I was like, was it really badly paid as well when you started? And, and my colleague was like, yeah, it took me three years to actually make money. It cost me more to work and to have the children looked after. I was like, who can sustain that? That's you know? why we're striking. <laughs> that's, that's exactly why we're striking. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I think a PhD can be really enriching if you are in the right department with the right people. I mean, I, I'm, I was thinking that I would, like to, I would have liked to do my PhD with the education department at um, Goldsmiths, the, whatever it's called, the education, art education department. But I was like, there's no chance I'll get funding. And there's this really interesting education person at the University of Nottingham, which was recommended to me by Jenna Graham, who now leads the B, um, BA in curating. And she put me in touch with her, and this woman who's brilliant, she was my second supervisor, said, we'll never get funding, go to geography, we'll do it across, they've got money, and, and they did. And, um, but there's something also good about doing a PhD somewhere else where you have a bit of detachment, or then the experience of you know, living somewhere else. Um, but you know, I guess I was based in London for so long that you know, it was fine for me, and I don't regret it. It's been an amazing experience, and I still believe I mean, they have tons of money. So you've got to go to a university that's got lots of money um, <laughs> and get funding. Never do a PhD if you're not funded. That's my advice. You know, I mean, the idea of doing research for university and then getting credit for something that I deem vaguely important, it matters to me, it matters to a few people. I don't know how many, but, uh, you know, it's like, I'm, you know, I'm a professional. I'm doing a piece of research around the profession that I'm involved in. I need to be paid for it. Any more? Well, sorry it was a bit dry. I don't, <laughs> I don't often do that. And also some of my students have heard a section of it, so I'm sorry to those of you who heard it before, but there were new things as well. Um, yeah, and feel free to, if you've got questions, feel free to email me, feel there free is to a, come and see me. There's a bar upstairs, yes, so if you want some, <laughs> people, people can ask you, ask some questions up there. Um, okay, let's stop for tonight, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>